An acrostic is often used to help or to aid us in remembering certain points that are made. An acrostic is very simply using or where certain letters are used in each line to form a word or words. Well, we're going to use an acrostic this morning and this afternoon for our lesson, but the word that we're going to use is the word church, and allow each one of those letters in the word church to form another word or words in relationship to our lesson. The first word in the word church is that word C, and it's going to stand for Christ. The church belongs to Christ. You know, we recognize in our everyday life that when we buy something, that that object that we have bought belongs to us. Uh, except when, of course, the bank owns it. Uh, but even then, we are paying the purchase price of it. Uh, when Christ purchased the church, so it belongs to him. He paid that price that was necessary for the church. Matthew 26 and verse 28, as he was instituting that Lord's Supper, that communion service, he says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Christ shed his blood. That blood that he shed was the purchase price in bringing about the New Testament, but also in purchasing the church. And we learn that in Acts 20 and verse 28, when he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Christ purchasing the church with his own blood, that blood that he shed upon the cross. He paid that purchase price. In 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, and I realize that a lot of brethren believe this has reference to the individual's body, but I, and I used to believe that, but uh, I now believe it has reference to the church itself and not the individual body, but he says in verse 20, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That body is the church. And thus Christ purchased the church. He bought it with a price. That price was the blood that he shed upon Calvary's tree. And thus the church has the obligation and the responsibility to glorify God. That which we do is to bring glory to Him. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, and verses 18 and verse 19, Peter would state, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received uh, from your tr fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So he makes comparison. Here's the purchasing of something, the redeeming, he uses that word, to redeem. Well, to redeem is to buy back. And I'm sure just about all of us uh, remember S&H Green Stamps and the Redemption Center where you would go and you would turn in all of those S&H green stamps that you had saved over the time in order to, they would redeem them for some object that you wanted, that you wanted to purchase. Well, that was a redemption center. What were they doing? They were buying back the green stamps. We're not redeemed with corruptible things. Silver, gold, the things of this world could not redeem us. 
And obviously that has reference to the redeeming us from sin. When we sin, we corrupt ourselves, we become the servant of Satan <clears throat> because we then serve him. We have to be redeemed. We have to be bought back to God. Well, it cannot take place with silver, gold, material things. Material things cannot satisfy the sin problem that we have. And thus, it cannot be a redemption using those objects. But it can with the precious blood of Christ. And so here's Christ shedding his blood upon Calvary's tree. And as such, the church belongs to him. He paid that purchase price. And it belongs peculiarly to him and to no one else. We don't own the church. It doesn't belong to us. It doesn't belong to the elders or to a preacher. It's not Alexander Campbell's church, as the denominational world would have us to believe, and which they falsely spread about. Alexander Campbell didn't start the church. Christ did. Alexander Campbell didn't pay that purchase price. Christ did. And so Christ is that one who paid the purchase price. When you buy something... And again, we recognize this principle from an earthly standpoint. When you buy something, it belongs to you. It's peculiarly yours. When I bought this suit, for example, or maybe Karen bought it for me. I don't know. She would remember. But uh, it became peculiarly mine. It doesn't belong to you. I can do with it what I want to as a result. But it belongs to me. doesn't belong to you. Well, so it is with Christ. Christ is the one who paid the purchase price. The purchase price being His blood. And as such, the church belongs peculiarly to Him and to no one else. But that takes us to the second point that we want to make in this. And that is the word, or the letter H in church. And we're going to allow it to stand for the head. As Christ paid the purchase price with the blood that he shed upon Calvary's tree, he thus becomes the head of the church. And the church only has one head. And he shares that headship with no other. Christ is that one who is thus the head, and he's described that way in Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, when God is, says that he put all things under his feet, Christ's feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. In Colossians 1, in verse 18, Paul reiterates this teaching when it says that he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. By the way, the word preeminence means power or the authority. He is the preeminent one. As such, he is the head. That headship and that preeminence goes hand in hand together. You cannot separate them. Headship thus denotes someone with authority. The head of the military would be those who would be the general. They've become the head of the military. Now then, uh, someone who's head of a base might be a colonel or some other officer, but he becomes the head of that base. He is that one in relationship to that base who has the authority. In that headship, he has the right to determine what is right and what is wrong. Or he has, when I say right there, he has the power 
that has been invested in him to determine right and wrong. In relationship to Christ, he is that one who is the head. Thus, he has the right to determine what is right and what is wrong. Much of that, what is right and wrong, is going to emanate from his very nature itself. Is that which is moral, moral because it is right or because God says it is? Well, it emanates from his nature. That was the... That was one of the points, if you, we remember back when we were listening to the war and flu debate. Mr. Flu tried to use that. Well, which one is it? Does God make it right, or is it right already? Well, rightness or wrongness emanate from the very nature of God Himself. It becomes right because that's what God is. Truth, for example, is right, and lying is wrong. Why? Because God is a God of truth. That's His nature. God is love, therefore love is right. And so there are certain things which emanate from God Himself as far as being right and wrong. There are certain things, though, that are right simply and solely because he has the right to state that they are. In other words, he has the power, he has the authority to state, do this, and you do it simply because he says it. Uh, when Brother Jerry Brewer was here in a gospel meeting a few years ago, he dealt with that subject as to laws and the two types of laws, whether they are moral laws or whether they are positive laws. Both of them come from God, but one of them we can understand. It's right because, for example, it's wrong to commit fornication or to commit adultery. We can understand that. It's an moral aspect. But baptism for the remission of sins. Why do we understand baptism? Why do we obey? Well, that kind of gives it away. Why are we baptized? And why are we baptized for the remission of sins? The sole reason for that is because God says to do it. That's authority. That's headship. The song that we sing, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. That take, is taken from Colossians 3 and verse 17, where Paul writes, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Do everything by His authority, in His name. When we're dealing with this, and this will also get into the next point that we'll make, but God authorizes certain actions. In regards to that which God has authorized, there are two aspects of it. There are things that are mandatory, and there are things that are optional. Then you have another category, that which God is not, or Christ is not authorized, and all of those things are sinful. God has authorized, or Christ has authorized, certain mandatory things. Those things that are mandatory, those things that are obligations upon us, that every person is obligated to do, and if they fail to do those things, then they sin. On the other matter, there are things that Christ has authorized us to do, but they are optional in nature. In other words, I can do it and not sin, or I can make the decision not to do it and not sin. It's authorized by God, but I am given the liberty to do it or not to do it. That's really the discussion in Romans, the 14th chapter, in eating of meats. 
You also see that discussion in uh, 1 Corinthians chapters 9 and 10 in particular, but also in chapter, uh, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, and then goes on in the 10 as well. We have the right, for example, to eat meat. But Paul is saying, if my right to eat meat, in other words, God has authorized me to eat meat. But do I have to do it? Is it mandatory? Do I sin in not eating meat? Well, no, I don't. I have the option of eating it or not eating it. And so Paul says, because it is one of those authorized optional matters, if it causes my brother to commit sin, then I will forgo my right to eat meat. Do I still have that right to do it? Yes, because God has authorized it. He did not make it mandatory. And so I have the right to do it, but I can also forgo that right. I do not have to take advantage of my right. Now, and if it's going to, and he said, if it's going to cause my brother to sin, then I'll forego the right. And by the way, that idea of if it causes my brother to sin doesn't mean simply if they're, they get upset or they don't like it. If it causes that individual to violate his conscience and thus commit sin, then... That's the type of situation. Not just to give in to some grouch over there because he doesn't like something. That's not what he's discussing there. But you have those two areas of what God has authorized. When it comes, for example, to assembling together on that first day of the week to engage in worship to God. That's not something that's optional. God has made that an authorized, mandatory thing. And if you don't do it, you sin. When it says to sing, we're given that authority to sing. That's not an optional matter. It's a mandatory thing. If we don't do it, we commit sin. Praying, partaking of the Lord's Supper, all of those things. God, Christ authorized those things, but they are mandatory that we do. And if we fail to do them, then we commit sin. Discussion in 1 Corinthians 7th chapter, to a great extent, deals with this very subject as to here is something that is authorized that is optional, and that is marriage. And in the latter part of the chapter, he says, because, or well, the middle part, he says, because of this present distress, it's better not to marry, but if you marry, you don't sin. What's he saying? It is an authorized action, but it is optional in relationship whether you decide to do it or not to do it. He says it might be more advantageous because of this present distress not to do it, but you don't sin if you do it. It's optional as to whether you do it or not. But every action that we take within life, and that's what Colossians 3.17 is showing us, whatsoever you do in word or deed... Anything and everything that we do in life must come under the authority of Christ. And if we don't have that authority, then it's sinful. See, so there's the two categories. You have that which Christ is authorized. You have that which he is not authorized. If it's that which he is not authorized, it is sinful. If it's that which he has authorized, then is it mandatory or is it optional? But being that one who is the head of the church, he has the right to set forth those things that are authorized. And he has the right to make those things either mandatory or optional in nature. 
and he's not going to share that headship with anyone else. A lot of times today, if you're listening to newscasts, uh, they'll talk about the head of the church. Well, they're talking about the Pope of Rome. And I agree with them. He's the head of the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, that is not the Lord's Church. It has nothing to do with the Lord's Church. And so, yes, he can be the head of the Roman Catholic Church, and he has that right, being the head of that Roman Catholic Church, to determine what's right and wrong. And they, through the years, have made changes as to what they have determined as right and wrong for the Roman Catholic Church. But he's not the head of the Lord's Church. Nor are the elders, nor are any individual. Christ is the head. He is the sole head. He is the only one that has that authority to determine what is right and what is wrong. And also, because he is that head, and he has that power, that authority to determine what is right and wrong, he has the authority to execute justice when we violate those things that he has authorized or we do those things which he has not authorized. Thus, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or evil, St. Corinthians 5 and verse 10. We're going to stand and be judged by Christ. Why? Because he's the head of the church. Because he has that headship and he has that right to determine to that authority to determine right and wrong. And we're going to be judged by him. But in that discussion, the next point that we want to make is the idea from you, which is unity. The church is to be found in unity. Christ prayed for such in his high priestly prayer, the Lord's Prayer, John the 17th chapter, verse 20 through verse 23. When he says, neither pray I for these alone. The these alone there has reference to what he's prayed for in verses 5 through verse 19, or verse 6 through verse 19, and that is the apostles. And so I'm not praying for the apostles alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may, or they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved me, as thou hast loved, or and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. There's an emphasis of oneness here. That's unity. And Jesus is praying for all believers to be one. And he likens it to the oneness of the Father and the Son. As we are one, so all believers are to be one. There is to be a unity that is there. That unity, then, that Christ prayed for is stressed in the Word of God. When the church is established in Acts, the second chapter. In chapter 4, then, we come down after the, the introduction of the persecution by the Sanhedrin. And it says in verse 32 that the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. This is not communism, as some have tried to present, that the early church was communistic. No, it wasn't. This was something that was voluntary. It was not done by the government. It was not something that was organized by the government. It recognized personal property, but they were willing to give of their personal property 
for the good of the church. And we see that that was not something that was mandatory. If you go into the next chapter, chapter 5, with Ananias and Sapphira, who sold a piece of property, brought some of the money, not all of it, but brought some of the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And when they were asked, did you sell it, the property for this much? And they said, yes, we sold it for that much. They lied about it because they knew they sold it for more than what they were giving. And Peter tells them, while it was yours, you had the right to do what you wanted to with it. That's not communism. That's uh, totally opposite of what communism is. You have no personal property on communism. And so that's not what he's dealing with, but there is a unity that is there. They were of all one heart and one soul. And they did this in selling their goods to give to those who had need and had all things common, but out of the goodness of their heart, because they had a unity that was there, a oneness of heart and spirit between themselves and other Christians. And so we see, as the early church begins, there's that unity that exists in the church. When Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians, though, that unity was being destroyed. And so he writes them and says in chapter 1 and verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same things, and that there be no division among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Be no division. That's not to be. You are to be united. You are to be perfectly joined together. That's the idea that really is unity. You are to be united. Later on, as he's writing that letter to them, as we come down into the 12th chapter, the 12th, 13th, and 14th chapters deals with miraculous gifts. And at the church at Corinth, what we see is that some were elevating themselves and being prideful because they had one miraculous gifts as opposed to some other miraculous gifts. And he says in uh, chapter 12, after listing at the very beginning of the chapter the nine miraculous gifts that the early church possessed, he says in verse 13, For by one Spirit... Are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit? Uh, let me just add here that the idea that we are for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body? Now, what we want for the lesson is the idea of the one body, the unity that is there. But just to offset this idea of baptism of the Holy Spirit that some try to read into this, the idea for, for by one Spirit is that this is not the element into which you're being baptized. You're not being baptized into the Spirit, but you're being baptized uh, by the agency of the Spirit. In other words, we're baptized in water baptism. Which, that's the element into which we are baptized but by the agency of the Spirit, that is, by the Word of God. The Word of God instructing us, the Spirit instructing us. That's the idea of 
for by one Spirit, the Spirit instructing us to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. But being baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins, what happens? We are baptized into one body. There's unity. And so he's showing that here's these uh, Christians at Corinth that were elevating themselves, saying, we're better than you, in other words, because we have, and it's kind of like today almost, the gift of tongues. You don't have that. You have some other miraculous power, maybe. But we're, we've got this gift of tongues. We can speak in tongues. And so we're better than you. And he begins using an illustration then of the body. There's one body, but all members are necessary or, and they are important. And he says in verse 20 there, But now are there many members, yet but one body. You've all been baptized into that one body, and thus, that one body, even though it comprises many members, and the members there are not denominational groups. They're individuals. All those individuals are in that one body. There is unity. Even though they might have different functions, they're one body. My hands do not serve the same function as my eyes. My lips don't serve the same function as my ears. And yes, it's still true. God gave us one mouth and two ears. Maybe we need to learn a lesson. But yet, those different areas within the body are still one body. There's that unity that he's dealing with. But that unity can only come through and is based on the Word of God. We mentioned John the 17th chapter a while ago in Christ the Lord's Prayer when He says, And either pray I for these alone, but for them all, but for them also which shall believe on me. Now notice this phrase, through their word. Now, we don't have time this morning to go into a study how that the Father gave to the Son His Word. The Son spoke that Word, would not change it, would not alter it. He gave that same exact Word to His apostles by the Holy Spirit so that they would be guided in what they said and what they wrote. Through that Word, thus... We believe, but there's that unity that comes as a result of that word. Notice again in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, that ye, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same things, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now there's three things that are mentioned here. Speak the same thing. What are we to speak? Where to, if any man speak, Peter says, let him speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. And so we speak the word of God. It's that same word that the Father gave to the Son, the Son gave to the apostles. They wrote it down. We speak it today. And when we speak that word, then unity is the result. We think the same thing. We have the same mind. What mind is that? We have the mind of Christ. For example, in Philippians 2 and verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And it talks about from there how that he would be willing to leave heaven's home and submit himself, humble himself under the will of the Father. What is that mind that we would have? To humble ourselves under the will of the Father, under the will of Christ as revealed within the Scriptures. And then the same judgment 
that deals with our application of that word, our actions. For example, when Christ says to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. When we act upon that, we immerse someone in water, and that is for that purpose of the remission of sins. If someone takes a little bit of water and sprinkles it upon his head, he's not work acting upon the authority of Christ then. He's acting upon his own authority. His actions are not the same. Why? Because he's not acting upon the Word of God. He's acting upon someone else's Word, or his own words, his own ideas. When we're doing what God says as revealed within the pages of the New Testament, then we're acting the same. That's the whole idea again of Colossians 3.17. What so are you doing, word or deed? Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. What is that? Well, here's what Christ has authorized. If it's mandatory, then we're all going to do exactly the same thing in the same way, for the same purpose, at the same time. If it is something which he has authorized, but is over here in that optional matter, then we have unity even in that optional matter. Even though you might like and wished we had put red carpet in this building instead of this green carpet. And someone else might have wanted blue carpet. And someone else might have wanted some other color. Yet, there remains unity because we are acting in the same way in relationship to those mandatory matters. And when we get over into these optional matters that Christ is authorized, then we realize that there is Christian unity, or a Christian liberty. One of the statements or qualities of love that set forth in 1 Corinthians 13 is love seeketh not her own. In other words, I'm not going to put my interest above other people's interests because I love them. And so if you wanted green carpet and we got green carpet, that's fine. If we got red carpet, somebody, because somebody or more people wanted red carpet, well, that's fine. I'm not going to make sure that my interest goes above your interest in relationship to those things that are optional in nature because I have love one for another. That's Christian liberty. And when we recognize and we do all of those things that Christ is authorized in His will, the revealed Word of God, then we have unity. When we inject man's ideas and try to allow man or some organization or group of men to take headship over Christ and dictate authority in matters that God has obligated us to do, then it produces division. The Word of God produces unity. But that's recognizing the headship of that one who purchased the church and it belongs to him. Now then, in becoming a Christian, Christ set forth the terms of entrance that we, upon our faith, repent of our sins, we make a confession of our faith in him as, Jesus, as the Son of God, and then we're baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. When we do those things, then we are... In, added by the Lord to His church. If you haven't done those things, we would encourage you to do them this morning. If you've fallen away as a child of God and you've done those things that God has not authorized, or you have failed to do those things that God has mandatory, made mandatory within your life as a Christian, and you realize your need to repent and come back unto Him this morning, and we would encourage you that as we sing this song to come and make those wishes known so that we can help you in being saved and having that home with God in heaven. You need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.